Uh, my name is Jörg Stuckmeier. I am a film auditor, media lawyer, and language learner based in Munich. I'm going to talk about how hearing and transcribing film dialogue and other audio can enhance your language skills. I have been told to uh, reserve at least 10 minutes at the end for questions, so I will do my best to observe that. And now, uh, without further ado, let's get started. Have you ever watched a film or a series in a foreign language that you've been learning for a while and had that exhilarating feeling when you could understand some of the dialogue? Without the subtitle? Perhaps you experienced that after watching the same scene several times, some dialogue lines stuck in your head and kept coming back like the lyrics of a catchy tune. And then you realize that you formed a memory by listening. You've tapped into the vast resources the human brain has for storing auditory input. In a minute, I'm going to show you how you can access these resources with the help of some efficient techniques. We'll look at some case studies, and I'm also going to share with you my personal story of how I learned Spanish and the detours I took until I found a method that finally helped me become conversationally fluent in the language. But first, Let's look at some basic scientific facts about learning. One of the keys to learning a language is forming memory. Without having memorized words and their meaning, we cannot understand nor write or speak. As language learners, we know that some serious mental work is required to learn words and phrases and recall them when we need to or want to. Memory consists of two functions, storage and recall. In simplified terms, information is stored in memory fields in various areas of our brain. Our memory is not held in any specific location, but is distributed throughout the brain, like a hologram. Not everything we see, hear, or experience is stored, of course. Only the things that we deliberately commit to memory, or that are relevant or interesting or associated with strong emotions. All such information, however, is stored permanently, practically for life. We've all had the experience of how a certain smell or sound brings back a memory from the first time we had that sensation. But why is it often so difficult to remember things we try to learn, like how to conjugate a verb, even after repeating it for the tenth time? When we memorize, storing the information is not the problem. The problem lies in recalling it. Unlike the memory of a computer, which uses addresses to retrieve information, brain memory does not have addresses. So how do we recall memory? According to research done by the American scientist couple Robert and Elizabeth York on memory and forgetting in the context of learning, our memory has a storage strength and a retrieval strength. Storage strength is about how well we've learned something and increases with studying and use. Retrieval strength is a measure of how easily we recall a piece of information, a name, a face, the year when we entered school, or the vocabulary we learned when we attended our first language course. Something we have deliberately committed to memory is never lost but it may not be accessible for us anymore because its retrieval strength is very low. The ability to recall a memory increases with studying with use. It also goes up each time we have to dig deep into our brain to retrieve a memory. Each of us has had the experience that when we finally recall something that was forgotten, it is now much more familiar and can be recalled over longer periods of time. Not only that, we often also remember things which are associated with the memory that we worked so hard to retrieve. We memorize better and also recall easier by associating the material with things we already know. This is the most common trick used by memory experts. People who can memorize hundreds of telephone numbers or tell within a few seconds which day of the week it was on August 12, 1894. They use associative algorithms for memorizing. Let's try one. 
let's suppose you want to memorize the following sequence of 14 numbers. You can do this by learning each number one by one or in pairs. It's quite likely, though, that you will have forgotten them in less than an hour after having memorized them. A better way to learn them is by using a little story like the following. I woke up at 5.30 with my three brothers and one grandmother. The ages of my brothers are 7, 9, and 13. And my grandmother is 89 years old, and we left the house at 6.34. This is a simple algorithm based on personal life experience, which makes the random numbers meaningful and easier to remember. What's so intriguing is that, apart from the numbers, the algorithm contains 132 letters. Yet for most of us, it is much easier to remember a story consisting of that many letters than the 14 numbers because of a familiar association. Which brings us to a very important fact. Memory is associated. For most of us, it is easy to memorize material by associating it with things we already know. Memory is most easily recalled if it's associated with something familiar, funny, outrageous, or stimulating, because the brain is attracted to it. Like music, for example. We all know the phenomenon of being able to remember the melody and lyrics of our favorite songs from way back when, even if we haven't heard them for decades. And not just a few songs, dozens, maybe hundreds of them, depending on how often we listen to music and how much we enjoy it. Some years ago, I was invited to a garden party at a friend's house. It was a sunny afternoon, there was a scrumptious smell from a barbecue grill hanging in the air and music playing from somebody's Spotify playlist. I noticed a young girl happily singing along to the songs. After watching her for a while, as she was churning out song after song, it dawned on me that she knew the lyrics to every song that was playing. This aroused my curiosity, so I started talking to her. I'm not a singer, she told me, when I asked her how she came to know all the lyrics. I just listen to a lot of songs because I like pop music. How many songs do you think you know, I asked her. I don't know how many, but I know all the lyrics to every Lady Gaga song because I love her music, she declared with a proud smile. At the time this happened, Lady Gaga had 13 albums out with 91 songs. After digging into my memory for the multiplication table that was drilled into my head back in school, talking low retrieval strength, I managed to figure out that if the girl was telling the truth, assuming that each song was around four minutes long and half of it was text and the rest melody, she had three full hours of song text stored in a permanent memory. And that was just Lady Gaga. And being that English was not her first language, this meant that she had learned all of it in a foreign language, simply by listening and singing along. Now, I'm sure you've heard the myth about how children are supposed to be better and faster at learning languages than adults. But is that really true? Think for a moment about how much time it takes children to really learn their native language well. On average, it took most of us the first 15 years of our lives to master our native language, to acquire an active vocabulary of around 20,000 words and to read and write well. Compare that to a two-year-old. The main difference is that an adult has choices about how to learn a new language which a two-year-old doesn't have. The two-year-old cannot read yet and only has very limited vocabulary in its native language, which it cannot even relate to another language. The only option small children have to learn a language is to listen and mimic first the sounds, then the words, and finally the sentences they hear from people talking. Acquiring or improving a language by listening to people talking is the most natural language learning method. I, I didn't know any of this when I started learning Spanish. I grew up in a monolingual family near Cologne speaking only German. Like most people who decide to take on the challenge of learning a foreign language beyond just being able to order food at a restaurant in their favorite vacation spot, I followed the standard path. I attended Spanish class, 
worked my way through a self-study course, memorized word lists, conjugation tables, grammar rules, and took some classes on italki. For the icing on my language learning cake, I then took the B1 level exam in Spanish and passed it with flying colors. A few weeks after that, I traveled to Spain, excited to put the finishing touches on what I'd learned and really build my fluency. But boy, was I unprepared for what was coming. My honeymoon period with the Spanish language ended abruptly upon arrival when I realized that I was barely able to say anything. I had a very limited number of phrases in my head and a hard time formulating sentences, although I'd practiced doing it. I didn't know how to express myself even in the simplest of terms. Worse yet, I hardly understood anything the natives were saying. I realized what a long way it was from learning the learning audios and videos I'd used for practicing to the real Spanish spoken in the streets. Most of the stuff I'd learned back home didn't help me out here in the real world. I also couldn't help but notice that natives had a hard time understanding when I tried to speak. My sentence structure was strange, my pronunciation was mostly off, and my accent didn't impress anyone. People back home had warned me, you're never going to learn the language well without living in a Spanish-speaking country for a while. Great advice, I thought. With a job and a family to support, I couldn't just pack up and move to another country for a while to immerse myself in a language I wanted to learn. When I returned home, I was so frustrated with my whole language learning endeavor that I decided to take a long break. A few months later, I was watching a movie on DVD that I'd already seen before, and halfway through it, I switched to the Spanish dub version. I repeated a few scenes which contained dialogue that I liked, and I noticed that a few days later, some of the dialogue lines would come back to me. Those were the ones I really liked. The rest, even though also interesting, I couldn't remember so well. I wanted to find a way to transfer it into my permanent memory. So I recorded the whole dialogue on my phone and listened to it on my way to work. With no images to distract my attention, I could fully focus on the words of the actors, how they express certain things, their intonation and pronunciation. Every time I listened to a scene again, I picked up a new word I'd previously missed. But I was facing a similar problem as during my trip to Spain a few months before. Like in real life, film dialogue is also spoken at a fast pace and contains a lot of slang. So I was always left with a bunch of words I didn't know or couldn't understand even after hearing them for the 10th time. The next time I listened to the dialogue, I paused the recording and started writing down the sentences that I thought I'd understood. First on little post-it stickers, which I would put up on the wall in my room. And when I ran out of space, I began typing the whole text into my laptop. Within a week, I had a 30-page transcript of the entire dialogue from a movie filled with plenty of spelling errors and gaps where I'd missed words. I knew that I needed a correct transcription to check my work and learn from my mistakes. I compared what I'd written with the Spanish subtitles from the DVD and corrected my errors. Where the subtitles didn't match with the spoken words, I asked a native speaker for help. The next time I listened to the recording on my way to work, something interesting happened. I was able to understand the whole dialogue without the transcript. My memory had formed a mental link between the written and the spoken words from the scenes, and many of the phrases stuck. I had no difficulty repeating them out loud in a flash. Without consciously memorizing anything, I had internalized sentence structures and expressions I did not know how to use before. After a while, I noticed that my listening comprehension for fast-spoken Spanish had improved. Because of the material I was listening to was so close to native speech, I was able to understand better when I listened in on conversations of Spanish tourists talking to each other on the bus. I would start manipulating some of the sentences from my transcript and use them when conversing with people and got praised for it. Hombre, tú hablas muy bien. 
but don't get me wrong, I wasn't able to say everything I wanted or when I wanted to, but it was no longer a huge struggle to actually speak. I began to ask myself, could this method work for other learners too, or was it just suitable for avid movie fans? So I embarked on a little mission and found language learners who were interested in trying out my method. For a few months, I spent half of my daily time allotted to language learning with editing sound clips from movies in German, English, and French, which I'd sent to volunteers with a list of instructions, analyzed their transcripts, and returned them with corrections and annotations. I would like to show you now the method in practice. I'll be using some sound bites from movies and I'll show you how learners transcribe them. The audios, the audios that were given to the participants were much longer than the samples I'm going to present here, three to four minutes on average. To keep it simple and anonymous, I created transcripts for this presentation, which show the most common errors and omissions people made and how, after giving them a little helping tool, the results improved. Let's give the project a name. Let's name it after the lead character in a French action film about a woman who, through a thin synthetic drug overdose, unlocks 100% of her brain's capacity. Introducing Lucy. OK, she doesn't resemble Scarlett Johansson, but so what? Note that Lucy is gender neutral, meaning that she represents the results from exercises done with about 10 learners of German, English, and French both male and female. All learners were given the same instructions. To listen repeatedly to the audio clip with the film dialogue until they felt they had grasped everything they could. And then they had to write down the dialogue while listening to the audio and pause the audio as often as needed until they had a full transcript of the spoken text. When they came across a word they didn't know, they were supposed to write it how they heard it and if all efforts failed, to just leave a blank. Uh, as you will see in the transcripts, I'm going to show you in a minute, the effort of spelling out unfamiliar words pays off because it forces you to really think how a word is written and what it means. This process helps your listening comprehension and spelling tremendously. I'm now going to play a few audio clips from several different movies and will then show you the transcripts made from them. Since we are at the Polyglot Gathering here, surrounded by multilingual people, the samples are in different languages. The first is a snippet from a monologue in English, only two sentences long. But remember that the audios given to Lucy were much longer, so there was a lot more material to absorb, which increased the error rate, as we will see in a minute. Uh, if you want, take pen and paper and write along. Uh, and now listen while I take you through this little experiment. This is my favorite room. Most days I love it because I can imagine the glass falling away and I'm outside. Okay, before we take a look at Lucy's transcript, I'm going to play the clip one more time and uh, ask you to try and put yourself in the shoes of someone who, in spite of having had several years of English classes, is not really used to hearing nor speaking or writing in the language. Because that's the reality for a lot of people that decide to pick up a language again after having learned it in school many years later. So here we go, one more time. favorite room.
Most days I love it because I can imagine the glass falling away and I'm outside. <laughs> All right, let's look at the transcript. As you can see right away, the transcript contains several mistakes. Uh, let's look at each one of them. Now, in the first paragraph, you might wonder how anyone with a few years of English classes would confuse the pronouns in the sentence and write mine instead of my favorite room. I can offer two possible explanations for this. One, Lucy simply didn't know the rule for using the correct pronoun, but it could also be that she thought that she heard the speaker say mine and wrote that down without realizing that this must be wrong and that the correct word has to be my. We'll see another example of this later on, but uh, these errors are common with words which sound similar, especially when they're spoken fast and are therefore easily confused. In the second paragraph, it's interesting to note that Lucy wrote down a word that's grammatically correct in the context, the verb to see, but it actually isn't the word that was spoken by the actress. The actress used the word imagine. Now, this is an example of how your brain gets tricked into filling in a word that's not actually there when you hear. By the way, I made these markups for every participant, all the Lucy's, so to speak, which they then use to analyze their mistakes. Okay, next I'm gonna play you the same short dialogue in German, and uh, it'll be interesting to see the typical difficulties learners of that language have with the same text. Here we go. Lieblingszimmer. An den meisten Tagen mag ich es, weil ich mir vorstellen kann, dass das Fenster herausfällt und ich draußen bin. Okay, let's look at the transcript and the corrections. Now, for those of you that know German, you will notice the type of mistake that was made here right away. German has a large number of so-called compound words, which allow combining a variety of grammatical elements, especially nouns, to create a word. So in the first line, it seems that Lucy knew the word for favorite, which is Liebling in German, but she tried to use it as an adjective for the noun Zimmer, which is room. In the second paragraph, Lucy wrote the word Fernseher, which means television in German, instead of the word Fenster, which means window. Uh, it's unlikely that she didn't know the word for window, but I would bet that after this exercise, she never confused the words for television and window ever again in German. This was a good exercise for her. Our next example is a short dialogue scene from a movie in French which um, it's spoken slowly, but it's not easy uh, to understand because of some colloquial expressions, which are not found in material for language learners. In other words, a bit of street language. Here we go. Okay, let's look at the mistakes marked in red and the words that Lucy missed, which I inserted in, in black here. 
In the first paragraph, we have two small errors. One is the wrong form of the verb faire, to do, to make in French. In the second paragraph, she used the present tense form, maybe because she wasn't sure about the future tense here, but uh, what she certainly took away from this was the different ways of using the verb pouvoir in French. And uh, in the fourth paragraph, this was very difficult to catch. The verb toll is a slang word for prison. So she's saying that her mother spent time in prison for a drug crime. In the last sentence of the paragraph, we have the expression sekasi, which is a colloquial term for to go away, to leave. And finally, in the last line, this mistake does not cause the sentence to become completely wrong, but the correct or better way to say this would be to use the future tense, reviendra, instead of the present tense here. Okay, before we move on to the last example, uh, let's take a moment for some observations about this technique of combining listening and transcribing. The problems you see typically fall into the following categories. The most common problem that people have is that they cannot understand words or entire sentences. I've noticed this even with the learners that consider themselves to be at an advanced level, like a B1 or above. The reason I think is that many people focus on textbooks and smartphone apps for learning language, but spend very little time just listening to native speech and really training their ear to the sounds of the language. And this is where the technique of repetitive listening and transcribing helps because you learn words and sentences, even if they're spoken at a fast pace. And the next time you hear them, again, it is much easier to recognize them. The other typical problem is that you don't hear a word that's being said. In other words, you miss the word either because the speaker doesn't articulate. So in Spanish, for example, and many other languages, natives have a tendency to roll words together, right? In Portuguese, this is also very typical. So they skip entire words. Um, or maybe the other reason, maybe because you're just focused on making sense of what is being said, and that's why you miss that word. Again, this is where comparing your transcript with a master transcript works wonders for your hearing. And finally, spelling errors. And we all know that the learning effect that you get out of analyzing your mistakes in the markup of your transcript really improves your writing. So let's look at Lucy's first version of the transcript for the next one. And I'm going to play this sound audio now. Welcome to my office. Nice music. Soothing sounds of corporate America. Over there is Jefferson Park. Mm. All the lights are off, so that's good. And over here is Chuck's house. No lights, no cops. <laughs> Seems quiet. I think we're in the clear. <laughs> Beautiful. You think so? Uh, from distance, I mean. Everything's up there, of course. Not you. All right. Let's look at Lucy's first version of a transcript without the corrections. And you'll notice right away that there are a few gaps where she apparently couldn't understand enough to be able to guess the word or the part needed in order to complete the sentence. And there are also some words that she thought she heard correctly but they were actually different. So the word soothing in the third line was difficult to catch unless you knew the expression in English of something being or sounding soothing. And um, look at the line in the last paragraph, starting with the words, and over here, 
There she didn't make out the word cops, the slang word for policemen, and wrote cops instead. Now, this is a good example of how the minute differences in how a word is pronounced can make the difference between understanding the word correctly and confusing it with another word. Now, I don't want to deprive you of the experience of seeing the transcript we've just analyzed while hearing the dialogue. So I'm going to play the audio one more time. And uh, if you want, you can check for yourself if you think you would have caught the words that Lucy missed. Here we go. Welcome to my office. Nice music. Soothing sounds of corporate America. Whoa. Come here. Okay, so over there is Jefferson Park. Mm. All the lights are off, so that's good. And over here is Chuck's house. No lights, no cops. <laughs> Seems quiet. I think we're in the clear. <laughs> Beautiful. You think so? Uh, from the distance, I mean. Yeah. Everything's up there, of course. Not you. Okay, um, now because Lucy had such a hard time transcribing the English dialogue from this movie, I decided to try out something that I thought might help her understand better. And what I did was I gave her the audios in two languages, English and French, her native language, and told her to listen to the English version first, write the transcript, and then listen to the French version uh, to spot words that she might have missed or misunderstood in the English version. So for all the French learners and French speakers out there, here's the version in French. Bienvenue dans mon bureau. C'est sympa la musique. C'est pour être aussi un des marques capitalistes. Alors, voyons. Là, nous avons Jefferson Park. Toutes les lumières sont éteintes, donc c'est bon. Et de ce côté, c'est la maison de Chuck. Pas de lumière, pas de flic. Tout a l'air calme. On s'en tire bien, on dirait. C'est magnifique. Tu trouves Enfin, vu de loin. Ouais. Tout est plus laid quand on se rapproche. Pas toi. Okay, the result of this little exercise was that after listening to the version in her own language, Lucy had no more difficulty with expressions like come on or cops. For example, when she heard the word flic in the French version, which means policeman, she was able to correct the error she'd made with the word cups. So by listening to the French version, she was able to fill in some of the gaps in her listening comprehension, and uh, even though this was in another language. Let me quickly sum up the results from these exercises and offer a conclusion. Finding a way to commit words and phrases to permanent memory and recalling them when we write or speak is one of the keys in mastering a language. Memorization is probably one of the most personal aspects in learning a language, but listening to native speech is crucial in developing not only good overall listening comprehension, but also vocabulary, intonation, and pronunciation. When we listen to something once or twice, we often cannot grasp all the detail. And because we quickly forget, we also cannot reproduce it. So an effective way to retain words and sentences permanently is by listening and transcribing fun and engaging audio material like film dialogue that reflects a natural way of speaking. This helps to improve not only our listening comprehension, but also our grammar, spelling, 
and even our ability to express ourselves more naturally in a language. Now, having listened to the audio samples with the film dialogue, some of you may be wondering about the usefulness of this kind of material. After all, your goal is not necessarily to talk like Scarlett Johansson or Leonardo DiCaprio, but to develop a natural way of speaking. Now, I've been using this technique for several years now and can say that it works. Film dialogue is spoken by natives. It's conversational and engaging, but of course, it's not tailored to the specific needs of language learners. And that is why I've started creating an online course that not only teaches this method, but also provides the content and practice. The course will be available this fall. It will have audio material similar to a movie or a series, a continuing story with dialogue split up into episodes of two to three minutes each, which are followed by short exercises and loads of other features to enhance the memorization process and have fun along the way. Because after all, let's not forget that learning a language should be fun, not boring. Thanks very much for watching and listening. Thanks also to the organizers of the Polygon Gathering for giving me the opportunity to do this presentation today. And I wish all of us an interesting and productive conference. If you have any questions or comments about the technique I presented or just want to exchange views about language learning methods, please email me. And now let's move on to the Q&A if there are any questions. First question I have here is, what is the minimum level that you need to have in a language in order to use this method? Well, uh, it of course depends on the film um, that you uh, choose. And uh, I would say the most important thing is in choosing a movie that uh, it's a film that you thoroughly enjoy, um, that you've probably seen before and that you uh, really like. Um, and the minimum level, I would say, is at least an A2, better yet a B1. But of course, it entirely depends on your listening skills or your listening comprehension, how far is that developed. Some people um, have a harder time understanding, others are already more advanced, so it's kind of difficult to tie it to a particular level in the language. The next question is, is it better to use movies that are originally in the target language or better to start with a dubbed version? Um, well, the advantage of using a film that's in the original version is that a lot of DVDs um, contain uh, the subtitles in that same language. So for example, if you're learning Spanish and you choose a Spanish film, a lot of DVDs will have the Spanish subtitles and the advantage of that versus a dubbed version is that the subtitles will be identical to the spoken text. Whereas when you choose a dubbed movie, you often have discrepancies between the spoken text and the subtitles. So that sometimes makes it difficult to check uh, the uh, your transcript basically or create your transcript. Next question, is there a specific place you can find film transcripts? Uh, you can search online. Um, there are, uh, for all the movies, uh, even Asian movies, I've recently checked. Um, but uh, there is no easy way to get access to film scripts and especially not the dub version. So you will be able to find some uh, transcripts for the movies in the original version, but for the dub version, you'll probably be out of luck. You have to create that yourself. If you find you're falling behind, do you stop the audio and try to catch up, or do you just keep going? Okay, maybe this is a misunderstanding. Um, the technique is basically um, that you should listen to the audio and do it at your own pace. So um, if you need 10 times to identify a particular word or a sentence, then that's fine. Use the 10 times or use 20 times. It doesn't really matter. 
take your time as long as you need in order to uh, write the um, the transcript. The point is not in listening and trying trying to write it while you listen, but take sentence by sentence and then write it down. How long should the pieces be? How many minutes? I would suggest uh, when you start out, pick a, a piece that's maybe two to three minutes maximum, ideally without too much background noise or too much music, so you can really focus on the words of the actors. Yeah. How many times do you suggest that the students listen before submitting their transcripts? Uh, that depends entirely on you. Um, I would say at least uh, 10 times is the, is the minimum number that you should listen to a piece of audio before you try to tra transcribe it. But again, it depends on your level. If you are uh, already very good um, and have no trouble understanding it, you can obviously start writing it down right away. But uh, if you have a hard time, um, take your time and listen to it more times um, until you really find uh, you have reached that level where you say, okay, I cannot hear anything more than uh, I have heard the last time I heard it. So push yourself, take yourself to that point, and then you've given everything you can, basically, for the transcript. Why is there background music? Does that serve a purpose? No, it's just the movie. Uh, movies, of course, are made with a lot of music and natural sounds, which makes it interesting, more interesting to listen to versus normal audio. Um, at least that's how I see it. And uh, it's just more engaging. It's more fun. Is it helpful to watch a movie, a movie in the target language dubbed with the target language rather than no dub? Um, Again, I think that depends on the, the f what kind of movie you, you want to listen to. If you have a particular film, for example, it could be a film from way back when, when you were a teenager, you just remember that movie, you said it's a great movie, I would like to see it again. If it's available in the dub version of the language that you're learning, then go for it and, 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 and take it and try to transcribe it if you want. I would suggest really to find the movie that's most interesting to you. Are you planning to develop a tool for the method? Yes, I am in the process of doing that. And uh, I will be launching a course this fall, uh, teaching that method and also providing the content, which means um, the individual episodes, a continuing story, and that would be tailored to the needs of language learners which movies, of course, are not. So that's the problem um, that you have. You are listening to a lot of material that may not be uh, adapt to your level or you may not be interested in it. So um, the course will, will uh, be focusing on teaching uh, gradually um, this method. How long does it take you to learn a language using this method? Um, well, you cannot use this method starting a language from scratch. Uh, I have not tried it, at least. Maybe it's possible. I have started uh, with Spanish after having learned Spanish, I think, for about two years. Um, and when I was already able to understand uh, quite a bit, um, it is a continuing process learning language, of course. So I cannot really answer that question in terms of years, but um, I can tell you that if you integrate that into your language learning, it will definitely uh, be a plus and it will help you move forward uh, much faster with respect to your listening comprehension, your spelling, your understanding of grammar and all of that, um, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the questions and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.